We are ready to go. Okay, great. Thank you, Bridget. Um, good morning to everyone. Thank you all for joining. Thanks especially to Greg Kesterman, Hamilton County Health Commissioner, who joins us um, for every briefing. And we've got a special guest, um, Dr. Debbie Hayes is with us. She's the president and CEO of Christ Hospital. Uh, thanks for joining this morning. Um, so as always, we're, I'm going to run through the numbers, um, but I do want to say that we're going to um, try to do this 30 to 45 minutes this morning. Um, the mayor is holding a press conference at City Hall at 1030. Uh, we've been coordinating his off with his office to try not to overlap on things. And so I know he's got an announcement. So we want to respect that and try to get this done within 30 to 45 minutes minutes. Um, so I will be brief um, at the top, but as always, I am going to run through the numbers. Um, the positive cases in Hamilton County as of today sit at 151,013. Um, the hospital, and, and let me, I'm going to, you know how I used to do the deltas all the time, the, the change from week to week. Uh, we stopped doing week to week, so I stopped doing that, but I do have a calculation here that gives a representation of a week over week increase. So the week over week increase here is 13,000 positive cases. Uh, so it just the, these numbers are really remarkable um, in a bad way. So hospitalizations sit at 5,047. The increase from last week is 150. And the deaths sit at 1,684. The increase from last week is 31. So as you, for those of you that have been doing this for a while, those positive case numbers are higher than they've ever been. The hospitalizations are higher than they've ever been. And the death rate is about as high as it's ever been and creeping up. So just to put that in perspective, a um, couple things from the county um, standpoint, we did declare a state of emergency yesterday at our meeting. Um, so the state of emergency, remember we issued um, a state of emergency back when we started this. So we are renewing the declaration for the state of emergency in Hamilton County uh, that was first issued March of 2020 and expired October 30th of 2021. Uh, we have now renewed that because we've got obviously this increase in cases related to Omicron. Um, in addition, hospitalizations are at a high point causing some non-critical procedures to be postponed. Hospitals reporting that 97% of those currently hospitalized are not fully vaccinated. And so we have declared a state of emergency. And what that allows the county to do, um, along with other things, is do more rapid purchasing for a quicker response to what we need in light of uh, what's happening in our community. Um, I do want to touch on testing quickly. And Greg, I know you're going to touch on this as well. Um, the city has rolled out a program for testing. The National Guard has come down to help with testing. The private sector is also in this space for testing. And remember, um, the county in the very beginning set aside 14 million for testing. Uh, and so we've been doing testing for a couple of years since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that money ran out at the end of the year because it was CARES Act money. So we have an RFP on the street. We will get the responses for that next week. And then again, um, roll out some testing. We've got 1.5 million set aside for that. And we're also looking into purchasing home test kits. Um, Greg and I have had some conversations with the Ohio Department of Health, um, kind of saying, saying, hey, uh, you know, the, the supply is certainly not meeting the demand in Hamilton County. And I know that's true uh, throughout the state. And because of that, we not only are talking to them about um, making sure we get our fair share, but also, you know, where are they getting the home test kits and how do we pile on and perhaps um, allocate Hamilton County dollars for that purpose and buy them ourselves. And so that's something that we're looking into. All three commissioners have weighed in and are supportive of that. Um, and so lastly, I just want to say, let's not forget about vaccinations and the availability of vaccinations uh, in this community. Go to Test and Protect Cincy to find information about vaccine and about testing throughout the community. It is a collective site that puts all the public and private information together, very easy to use, and there are spots available in all cases. So with that, Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sounds great. Thanks, Commissioner, for the intro. Uh, as you mentioned, COVID-19 is certainly in our community right now. Week after week, I share the number of active cases within Hamilton County at this moment in time. We have 30,000 active cases of COVID-19 within Hamilton County. That means there is a lot of opportunity to get sick if you're not being careful. 
And so I would just continue to urge the public to be as cautious as possible and maybe reduce some of those extracurricular activities at this time to help keep yourself and family safe. Looking at cases over time, back in December of 2020, we were at our all-time high at 716 cases per day. Clearly, you can see today we are significantly greater than that at 1,735 cases per day. So just really have come a long way with regards to activity in the last few weeks. Looking at this over time, you, I'm going to um, go through a few slides real quick just to show a progression. This is August, September, October, November, December, and here's where we are at today. The entire county is inundated with COVID-19 cases. We have it in every community. I will point out this little yellow is just an issue with some of the data. It doesn't mean that community or that census tract is any better than anywhere else. We have a lot of COVID out there and all over the county. So it's really important that everyone is cautious at this time. Our reproductive value for Hamilton County this morning is at 1.11, and for the region, we are at 1.18. And our positivity for the region is at 33%. Hamilton County is below that at about 25 and three quarters percent. Shifting to hospitalizations, um, and I won't spend too much time um, as... Um, I think it's just shocking how many folks are in the hospital right now. We have 981 individuals within the hospital. As said before the press conference, this is um, a significant increase over at any other point in the pandemic. We have 175 individuals within the intensive care unit and 133 individuals on ventilators. We will hear more about this later, but procedures that do not place a patient's immediate health or well-being at risk, nor contribute to the worsening of a serious life-threatening medical condition are being delayed. And this is, you may recall back in December of 2020, this was under order of the Ohio Department of Health. This time around, it's being done um, by the hospital systems because of the immense burden that they are under. The very next slide I'm going to show um, talks about vaccinations. You know, at this point in time, we hear so many individuals talk about how their friends got COVID-19 and they were vaccinated and boosted. So the booster and the vaccine must not work. Our hospital systems work with Cincinnati Children's Hospital and the Health Collaborative. And weekly, they put out a number of individuals within the hospital systems that are COVID positive and have been vaccinated versus unvaccinated. The week ending January 5th, 2022, 97% of COVID hospitalizations were among those who have not been vaccinated. So as mentioned, if somebody is vaccinated and gets COVID, that's normal. The vaccine is doing an amazing job of keeping the public um, from developing serious COVID-19. At this moment in time, we all know people who have been sick with COVID, but the majority of them, if they've been vaccinated, are not ending up in the hospital. As far as deaths, you can see we are continuing to see about four to five deaths over time per day. So a significant burden uh, there as well. Our Centers for Disease Control is reporting that Hamilton County is high incidence of COVID-19 transmission, as well as the entire state of Ohio. We have 1,524 cases per 100,000. Our percent positivity, as mentioned, is 27.74 this morning for Hamilton County. We continue to make a lot of work with vaccinations, uh, particularly the young, younger age group and boosters are what I am seeing the most folks within our clinics, uh, that five to 11 year old range. We also know that boosters are now available for those over the age of 12. Um, so we are excited to be able to offer those to our community. The best spot is Commissioner Driehaus indicated to go see testing locations and vaccination locations is testandprotectcincy.com. You can find locations. I know over the course of the end of 2021, there was a significant demand and it was really hard to find testing locations. I was on uh, this website this morning and without any issue, I was able to find both PCR testing and locations to get uh, test kits. So please take advantage of this website. It's up to date. It lists the three National Guard sites that are in our region. There are uh, three locations, one at Riverbend, one at UC's Clifton, UC Health's Clifton campus, and one just across the border um, at Crossroads uh, in Mason. So really excited about these opportunities. These are private partnerships with the Ohio National Guard and are clearly making a difference um, in providing additional access to testing. 
I also routinely get asked this question about when can you get your booster after testing positive for COVID-19? And the answer is, if your isolation period is over, you are eligible to be boosted. So once you're starting to feel better, you're out of isolation, you've been fever-free for a few days, I would encourage you to get come and get a booster shot. For anyone who's hearing today's presentation who wants to get vaccinated, our Board of Elections location is open today. Walk-in appointments, no appointment necessary. Just come on in, get vaccinated. Typically, there is no line. So great opportunity to get um, tested, or I'm sorry, vaccinated. And the last slide I have, I just wanted to give one more update on flu in Hamilton County. You can see the black line is the five-year average. The red line is the 2021-2022, or this year's uh, flu data. And the blue line is where we were at when we were working together as a community by wearing masks, social distancing, keeping sick at home, and doing all of these infectious disease control measures. So I would just encourage everyone to work together to help one more time flatten this curve. Let's be cautious over the next few weeks so that we can minimize the impact of COVID in our community. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and I'm going to turn it right over to Debbie Hayes, again, CEO and President of Christ Hospital. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, Commissioner Driehaus, thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner Kesterman, thank you uh, so much for allowing me to join you this morning. Um, you know, I think uh, both Denise and Greg have talked about the fact that we are at a critical stage in this pandemic. Um, as you saw by the graphs that Greg uh, had demonstrated today, uh, the number of COVID patients in hospitals across this community is about 30% more than at any time during the pandemic to this date. And people ask me, why is this different than what it was like in the very first part of the pandemic? And as Greg alluded to, as you will remember, by a governor mandate, uh, the hospitals were asked to shut down all of their elective surgeries, elective procedures, and anything other than what was absolutely necessary to take care of the community. And as you know, the community has worked together over the past two years to ensure that all of the community has had extraordinary health care. Now, when that happened, although no one liked it, we also know that because we had to do it at the time, uh, the ramifications of doing such uh, were borne out over the past two years where patients were actually sicker post that time frame than they were prior to because they were putting their health care on hold. That is not where we want to be. So right now the healthcare systems are trying to manage a full complement of services so that we don't see the negative ramifications of what happened in the first wave, as well as dealing with a pandemic that is now out of control again. And so today, I think what it's important to understand is that this is different than any time during the pandemic and that the health systems are working together across the community to ensure that not only do we take care of the immediacy needs of the COVID patients, but also to all the other patients in this community, but we are at a critical point. And as uh, Denise and Greg both indicated, we need the community's help at this time because unlike other businesses who are certainly under um, tremendous stress as well because of staffing, because of a number of illnesses in their uh, employee, we cannot shut our doors nor will we turn our doors and our lights off. And so we need to be here for the community to be able to provide healthcare no matter what the circumstance. But right now, healthcare systems are filling about 100% of the normal beds used in hospitals across this community are filled, not only with COVID patients, but with patients who need life-saving treatments. 100% of our ICU beds are filled on a daily basis, and there are long waits in our emergency rooms, in our urgent cares, and in uh, you know, requests to get patients transferred into the community from our partners out in the community who do not have the capability to care for patients with serious illness. That being said, we will continue to provide care, but we need this community's help. We need everyone, as Greg said, to mask. We need everyone to get their vaccines and get boosted if they are eligible to do so. We need everyone to reduce their gatherings in large quantities. And if you have to be in those situations, please make sure that you are all masked, regardless of your vaccination status. One of the things about Omicron that is very different than all of the other 
uh, variants of uh, this COVID virus is that its transmissibility efficiency is at least twice what any of the other strains of this COVID um, virus have been, which means that it is a virus that spreads almost, if not, as easily as measles. Um, one of the most transmissible viruses in the history of the world. And so this is a time when the entire community needs to come together. Uh, we need to be serious about this because we do not want to put uh, continued stress on the healthcare systems and our businesses in this community uh, because of the deleterious effects to both uh, individuals who have COVID and quite frankly, to individuals that have other illnesses that need to be taken care of. And so I'll stop there and uh, uh, you know allow for questions. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hayes. Really appreciate you being here this morning. Um, all right, Bridget, we're going to go straight to questions. First, we have um, John London. John London, uh, if you could turn on your mic and your um, video. Good morning, John. Good morning, everyone. I think can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so. Um, uh, just one brief question, and um, you know, I, I took note of what Dr. Hayes just said about reducing gatherings in large groups, regardless of vaccination status, wear a mask. All of this is coinciding with arguably the biggest Bengals game in 31 years. So um, I, I wonder um, what um, you know, Dr. Hayes, and also Greg, what, what you would say right now with regard to what you are recommending with regard to mask wearing, just in general, um, we got, you know, the bars are gonna be packed, and then also at county facilities. And since COVID is so widespread, um, what's the recommendation on, on the best mask to wear? I wear a cloth mask, I'm, you know, are you recommending surgical cloth, N95? What should people do? I'm happy to start if uh, if you'd like. Um, you know, John, I've been saying for a long time, I think people need to make some personal assessments on what is safe for their family. Uh, if your entire family has been vaccinated and boosted, I think you can potentially go to this game safely. When I am in crowded settings right now, I am wearing both a surgical mask as well as my cloth mask. And that I feel like gives me a little additional protection. Um, when, when I'm outside and away from people, I don't wear a mask if I'm, if I'm out by myself. But once I come back into contact with people, I put it back on that mask to help protect myself. So if you're planning on going to the stadium or to a, a bar, I'd recommend you mask up. I'd recommend after you take a drink of your beer to put back on your mask. And it's really a small ask that we are, are making right now because we know it can make a difference. Uh, the one other point I want to make is a lot of folks are talking about KN, KN95 masks as well as N95 masks. And it's important to point out that those are meant to be fit tested and really are meant to be worn by those who are putting themselves at significant risk taking care of us. If you don't particularly fit that mask to your face, it will not be effective and will not do its job. So you're kind of spending extra money on a mask that's not doing a lot to help you. I shared yesterday during the commission meeting that myself, if I were to wear a mask, I have a beard. And so that KN95 mask does not have a tight fit to my face and really will provide me no greater protection. So just one other item to keep in mind. I'll stop there. John, John, do you have another question or? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I've got to get to City Hall like, like, like the rest of you too. But, but I mean, this is all, I, I didn't know if, if Dr. Hayes had anything that she wanted to say about, you know, with this ball game coming up, uh, which everybody's excited about. But hearing you guys talk about the spread, uh, you wonder what, what is the best thing to do for people who are going to gather. You know, John, I would agree with uh, Greg. Uh, I think if you are fully vaccinated and boosted, um, going to that game is perfectly fine. But I would encourage everyone, regardless of your vaccination status, to wear a mask at any time when you are in public, certainly if you are inside in closed spaces, um, and try and maintain social distancing. The transmissibility of the Omicron, of the Omicron virus as I said, is extraordinary compared to all other variants at any time during this pandemic. And let's just be honest, there are people who have been vaccinated and are boosted and they have obtained 
um, and they are COVID positive now. So it is not outside the realm of possibility that you can uh, get the virus even though you are fully vaccinated and boosted. Now that percentage is very, very small in comparison to unvaccinated or vaccinated and not boosted. But the reality is this virus is incredibly transmissible. So I am a huge Bengals fan. I would hope that everybody at the stadium on Saturday evening has a mask on in support of this city and in support of each other. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Next, we have Larry Seward from WCPO. Good morning, Larry. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Good morning, Debbie. I am hearing strong language. I'm hearing Debbie say, situation of hospitals critical. Um, Greg, sounds like you were amazed the number of hospitalizations, you too, Commissioner Driehaus. What I'm not hearing is the language of people must do X, Y, Z. Um, obviously, 2020 mandates were a thing, and there's still discussion about that politically. Are we not saying people have to do something because we know the reaction will divide as opposed to encourage? And are you using the strongest language possible to encourage people to, to use the measures that you're talking about? Let me let me just weigh in, Greg, and I, I will appreciate you um, also weighing in. You know, a lot of what we saw in the very beginning, Larry, were mandates from the state. And so we were following the governor's lead when it came to those mandates. Um, you know, frankly, I don't the county commission doesn't have the authority to do much of what the governor has the authority to do. Um, but we were happy to follow his lead and try to keep the community safe. Um, we do have a mask mandate here at the county. We've had one for months and months now um, trying to keep each other safe. So um, I think, you know, we're doing what we can, but it, it, it is different than when it was in the beginning because the government um, at the state level um, is behaving differently. Greg, I'm going to let you elaborate. Yeah, I think the only other thing to add on, um, you know, I feel like I am providing a very accurate and unfortunately dire situation for where we are at with COVID right now. And so I would hope the general public is able to take this mes message and make good decisions about it. You saw my flu data, you know, we heard, we heard last year was pretty much no flu, nobody in the hospital with the flu. We know that uh, as a community, we can come together and make this thing work, but we actually have to try hard and we all have to do our part to make sure that we can slow the spread of COVID. I do want to say too, if there's been any lack of clarity, the message is go get vaccinated, wear a mask, and avoid large crowds if you're unmasked. I mean, that I think we've been very clear with our message. Um, it's, I guess you're referring more to the mandate piece, but uh, and to clarify, the county mandate is for county buildings, which is what uh, that's the authority that we have. One last thing to add on, if you wake up and you're getting ready to go to the Bengals game or to a bar or to a party and you feel like you have a cold, you probably have COVID. Please keep sick at home and stay home. Yeah, Larry, one of the things I just wanna make a comment on, um, and again, one of the things that I said earlier was that um, the health of this community was severely affected because people delayed care during the original waves of the pandemic. The message that I want to send is the hospitals are here to take care of patients. If you need to come to a hospital, come to the hospital. It is absolutely safe. It is safe to go to your physician offices. It is safe to go to the urgent cares. If you do not need an emergency room, please call your primary care physicians or visit one of our urgent cares before you come to the emergency room. But if, if, if people in this community believe they need that level of care, the hospitals are open and we will continue to take care of people. What we need to do is we need the community to help us so that we can continue to do that in a way that has been an extraordinary healthcare system reputation, one of the best in the, in the world, quite frankly, in this city, and we need the community's help. To that point, Debbie, what is the next hard decision that your hospital is staring at that the public may not be aware of? You, we're talking about you know, the procedures that are not emergent being delayed before it was the state telling you to do that. Now it is hospitals that, you know, on two ends, you're tasked with the well-being of your patients, which you want to provide, and also turning away, you know, people that come there for care. And that's what you exist for. So what is the next hard decision that you're looking at? Right. That's a really great question, Larry. So let me be clear. At this point in the community, all health systems are limiting elective inpatient surgeries, which means any, any 
uh, surgery or procedure that we think might require an overnight stay, because again, we wanna make sure beds are available for patients that absolutely have to be there. Um, we will have to make other decisions about further reducing those schedules if the numbers of COVID patients in the hospitals continue to climb. Um, the other thing that we are doing that um, none of us want to do, but we have to do, the number of patients that any individual physician or any individual nurse or care team is taking care of uh, is being extended because we have to take care of patients regardless of the numbers uh, you know, in the hospital. We are opening up additional care units as best that we can with the staff that we have available. And we are um, in many cases in hospitals across the community and every hospital is different based on the census of the day, uh, placing inpatient patients in uh, beds that are traditionally not used for uh, inpatients. Um, and those are the things that are part of all of our emergency playbooks. It's something that we plan for uh, during the last uh, waves of the pandemic, and we have been successful in managing that to this point, but the numbers of patients coming to the hospital to be admitted at this point is extraordinary compared to any other time in the pandemic, and the peak is not here yet. And so we will continue to make those decisions, um, and we will also continue to make decisions about provision of care for those patients in the hospital based on the availability of equipment, uh, and the availability of supplies to care for patients. Real quick, last question for Greg. Yeah. Greg, the, um, you mentioned being amazed at the hospital numbers. Why is that? I know people are looking at Omicron and saying it's, it's more benign. The impacts are less severe. So why would we have more severe outcomes? Why are you surprised by or amazed by that hospital number? You know, I think Dr. Lofgren hit this uh, correctly last week when he was on the press conference. You know, with Delta, we had a lot of our community sick. With Omicron, we have so much more of our community sick. So many people from the mapping that I shared with you during the, the briefing, our entire community right now is sick with COVID-19, particularly the Omicron variant. And with those numbers of people sick, it's only um, a matter of statistics as to how many will end up in the hospital. And I think it's just, it's amazing how many people I know personally, a part of my team here at Hamilton County Public Health who are either quarantined or isolated, you know, it's impacting the entire community and it's really eye-opening um, the importance of each of our individual roles to help keep one another safe. Thanks, Larry. We got Brooks Sutherland with the Cincinnati Inquirer. Good morning, Brooks. Hey, good morning. Uh, Commissioner Drias, if you want to just quickly uh, expand a little bit on what the, the state of emergency will allow you to do, if it's getting more supplies quickly, um, just, just what that, that'll mean for you folks. Yeah, that's primarily it. it. It's about purchasing ability and about getting supplies quickly and having the administrator uh, the ability to not have everything run through uh, a vote for the, from the county commission. Uh, and so that's very helpful when it comes to uh, expeditiously getting supplies. It also in the past has allowed him to redirect staff for emergency purposes. And also the emergency management agency um, is on a high alert and they too have procedures that kick in. So that's, that's the bulk of it. Um, but from my vantage point, the purchasing piece, especially when we talk about home test kits is very high on the list. And, and, and one more question. Um, I think Debbie mentioned just the, the, the sheer number of breakthrough cases that are happening with that. And, and with that being said, there's still a very large gap among people that are vaccinated and boosted. Um, I'm just wondering what you folks are doing and what you can do to try and get that that booster number up, knowing that with this this variant, there's just so many breakthroughs that happen. So, Greg, I'm going to let you talk about the vaccine clinic at the BOE. Yeah, so, you know, um, there are appointments everywhere in our community. Hamilton County Public Health is proud that we're able to move around our community, but we also have a location at the Board of Elections um, in Norwood, which is very central in Hamilton County. We have a great team of staff. If you want to come and just ask questions because you still have concerns, we have nurses on, on hand that can help you with those. If you want to come and get vaccinated, uh, please just show up and we will have you vaccinated, whether it's the Janssen, the Pfizer, the Moderna, the Booster, the pediatric version, we're ready for you and we, we would welcome you today. Hey, Greg, can you also share the story when you were out and about on Saturday? Um, I have had so many stories <laughs> after. It was, it was, I'm trying to remember what population it was where you vaccinated oh. a lot of folks. 
Yeah, so on Saturday, we were in Colerain Township and we held a, a clinic for the Nepalese community. And uh, we, we nearly ran out of vaccine. We actually had 409 people show up that day. It was a well-run clinic. The community was excited to have us. So once again, we're out there, we're moving around. Um, we're really trying to make sure that we're bringing vaccine to, to the people that want, want to be vaccinated. That's right. And, and let's not forget test and protect, which there, there are many opportunities beyond just the Board of Elections and the mobile unit. Um, but those are you know what the county is most interested in, of course, and in, in helping fund. But um, there are many other opportunities. Go to test and protect since and you can find those. Thank you. Next up, we have Chris Wetterick with the Business Courier. Morning, Chris. Hey, good morning, Denise. Um, this is a little bit off of uh, Larry's question earlier, but do you think the governor should start to reinstitute some of these health measures, specifically the mask mandate statewide? Do you think that's a public policy choice he should make? Um, my understanding is that the governor, whether he would want to do that or not, his hands are tied because of uh, the actions of the legislature. And so, um, as I said in the beginning, and, and Greg, you talked a lot about this, um, you know, we were in a position to follow the lead of the health professionals in Columbus and at the state level, and we did that, and we, and we did it well, we all did, uh, and we should, um, but that uh, dynamic has changed. Um, I don't, I have not spoken to the governor as to whether or not he would take that same posture at this moment in time, but the fact of the matter is, it, it won't matter. Uh, the legislature has taken that authority away effectively. And um, so there's not much he can do in that space. Thank I you. will tell you what he is doing. Um, so uh, he has uh, deployed the National Guard uh, first in the Northeast. Uh, and we have National Guard members uh, coming to the greater Cincinnati area. Actually, some of them are already here helping with testing and beginning next week, uh, at least uh, couple of our health systems in the city, including my own, we'll have National Guardsmen inside the hospitals helping us to staff our units uh, and do things that they are trained to do. Um, and so you ask what is different about the last pandemic or the last wave of the pandemic? We had National Guard that was here helping us to try to set up the convention center. That is very different now. We are going to be using them inside the hospitals to supplement our staff uh, to continue to care for patients. And that is significantly different than the first time. But we are very grateful for the governor and we are very grateful for our guardsmen who will be here to help us. Thank you. Next question is from Christian Hauser with Local 12. Good morning, Christian. Thank you very much for, for taking my question and for, for doing this. We do greatly appreciate it. Kind of continuing off Chris and Larry, um, should counties have the power to do this given how, how diverse and different parts of Ohio are, I mean, we are, you know, every day it's record numbers this, it's we're at capacity. Should counties have the ability to, to make these health orders and, and bypass the governor and Columbus in general? Well, that would uh, require a change in the Ohio Revised Code. <laughs> so um, I am not optimistic that counties are going to get more authority at this moment in time related to COVID. <laughs> so uh, it's very... Though, it's, yeah, we don't have it. yeah we don't have home rule authority um, as cities do and so it's a different kind of dynamic um, so you know I think we're doing what we can um, but we yeah it, it, should we have more authority well yeah you know, on all things of course but <laughs> but um, I, I just I don't think that's in the offing anytime soon if you could though would you would you try to declare one right now and maybe that's for Greg as well yeah, well, and, and I will say, I was just going to say that we always do follow the advice of our health professionals. I am not a health professional, which is why I always have experts on the briefing with me. Um, but yeah, we're always following the advice and trying to keep the community safe. So Greg, I will let you respond. You know, to be honest, because we don't have the power uh, to do so, I have not really had any time with my team to discuss it. If we did have the power, I would certainly sit down with a panel of experts, both from my team and from our community before making any type of a decision like that. Um, we have seen from uh, the lockdowns of last year, those have an impact on the economy. Keeping kids home from school has an impact on child well-being and mental health. You know, there are so many decisions that need to go into play before um, something that large could happen again. And I, I would say that if we had that opportunity, I would make sure that it was done not inside of a box, but with lots of community input. My other question concerning money and rental assistance, uh, Commissioner Stephanie Dumas uh, yesterday voiced some concern regarding money not getting out fast enough. We've had 
plenty of people reach out to us saying that they're trying to do everything that they can to try and get this rental assistance. Um, you know, we're I'm a, almost a year into the, the rental assistance of this, if not longer. Um, what can be done to speed up getting that available money into the hands of the, the renters and the landlords who need it? Yeah, well, we've changed our tact on that a little bit. In the beginning, we were using uh, CAA, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, Free Store Food Bank, Talbert. We had a lot of different partners, uh, and it was a little spread out, uh, this assistance. And so now we have uh, pushed all of the dollars into JFS. Uh, they have a large staff. They're capable of moving through these applications quickly. And so that was the change that we made. We are also hiring people at JFS to accommodate that, and we have done that. Uh, and so I think we're, we're doing okay. We do have a bit of a backlog, but we are moving as quickly as we can to get that rental assistance in the hands of the folks that need it. The other thing that we have done is talk to the landlords. I mean, it's not only the renters, but it's also the landlords that need to understand that we're serious about this assistance. And if they can be patient with their uh, tenants, that the money will come. And so those have been very fruitful and very productive conversations. And so people are, in many cases, sitting tight. Some people are being evicted. I don't want to gloss over that. Um, but we are trying really hard to not only talk to one piece of the equation, but also the other piece of the equation. Last question, one more time, just to, to reiterate it, because I will say the messaging has been on point. It's almost, I feel like, Greg, when you and I talk, it's almost the exact same thing. Wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands. Be smart about this. We're a year later. It, the situation's worse than it was last December. I, it almost seems like people aren't listening. If you look at a Bengals game, you know, very few, if any of those people are out there wearing a mask, and that's 65,000 people jammed together. Is there anything else? That, that she can do other than ask nicely and, and tell people to, to be smart and be safe. You know, providing education and, and, and bringing us all together in this forum is really one of the best tools that we have to make sure that the public has the information necessary. I will say, you know, infectious disease control, really when we're talking about slowing the spread of COVID, it's really basic. I mean, the things that we've been saying now for, for nearly two whole years are just really basic concepts of washing your hands and keeping sick at home and covering your cough and, and just these basic things we can do as a community to make make COVID-19 kind of go away or slow down within our community. So um, yes, unfortunately, this is the best tool I have right now, but I do continue to plead with the public to work together, really help our hospital systems out so that we have the ability to take care of people when they show up at the emergency room. Chris, if I could just make a comment, all of you could be very helpful too, and you asked a really important question. We've been saying this for a year, but it is different, right? The Omicron variant has created a different dynamic than the original alpha variants. And so the message needs to be, this is not like it was two years ago. This is very, very different. And we need to take extreme measures to try and protect this community. And so, um, you know, that messaging needs to be, do not delay care, go to your doctors or come to the hospitals if you need care, but do all the other things. Get vaccinated, get boosted if you're eligible, keep your masks on, reduce your, um, you know, transmissibility because you're social distancing and try to stay away from big crowds. But if you can't, keep that mask on all the time. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Christian. Seems to conclude our questions from reporters. All right, very good. I think we're kind of running right on time here. So again, thanks to Health Commissioner Greg Kesterbin. Thanks also to Dr. Hayes. Really appreciate your insight uh, and your um, your uh, ability to be here. So I, as promised, I'm going to read a quote that I got last night. So I got a text last night from a woman who works at Christ Hospital and she, she talks about um, you know, what's going on there. And I just wanna leave this with everyone. Um, she says at the end of her text, this is the worst it has ever been. This is the most patience we have ever had with less staff. This is truly an emergency. Also, do not climb on any high ladders for a few weeks. I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.